Thank you. My name is Roger Berkowitz, and uh, I'm thrilled uh, once again to welcome you here to the Courage to Be lecture series. Um, you all should now be fully into the Courage to Be courses for the semester, and uh, I hope you've had an opportunity to um, be thinking about some of the common texts, the Hannah Arendt, the Paul Tillich, I know our class hasn't read the Tillich yet, uh, and some others, and, and the role of courage, uh, moral and political courage, the way we talk about it in the class, or in the, in the Courage to Be seminar, in, in, in your lives. And the talks that um, uh, we're, we're offering you are really opportunities to bring uh, special individuals, people chosen by your colleagues, students here at Bard, who are Courage to Be fellows, um, after they do research, um, and bring people in that they think uh, will have something unique and innovative and exciting to say about what it means to live a courageous life in the 21st century. We've talked a little bit about the challenges of that, given the bureaucracy and the conformity of the times. Um, and, and a large part of the course is getting us to think about what does it mean to live intentionally a, a courageous life. Um, just a few announcements. This is the second talk in the, in the Courage to Be series. The third one will be next Monday, so one week from today. Um, and the, the speaker next Monday um, is uh, Whitney Dow, uh, who's a filmmaker. And he made a film called The Two Towns of Jasper, which he will be, which he will be talking about. And it will be screened Wednesday, so in two days at 7 p.m. at Weiss Cinema. We'll be sending out a, a note. Um, we'd really love you to see it before the talk if you can. Um, if you can't see it Wednesday, um, is it available on one of the websites? Does anyone know? Netflix or Amazon? We don't know. We'll let you know. We'll see if we can find a link. But I hope you can make it Wednesday at 7 in Weiss Cinema. And then he'll be speaking here at Blythewood next Monday at 6 p.m. Um, one or two just other announcements. The, the, we're showing a, a really fascinating film uh, about the settlements in Israel and Palestine called The Settlers, uh, directed by uh, Shimon Dutan, who will be here talking about it. And that's going to be on Tuesday, March 27th, right after spring break at 7 o'clock in the Campus Center. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that uh, the, th the three required lectures uh, are, are the ones that are required. But one of the really exciting things about the Courage to Be course is that we have these dinner conversations that the fellows organize. And each of them get to invite um, a professor from the campus to um, come and have dinner at the RN Center. And you guys can come and talk to us. And there's a short talk about uh, something, that courage, some aspect of courage that's meaningful in their lives. And then a dinner discussion. It's like a dinner party. And some of you, I'm sure, know that Bard is the dinner party school, according to The Onion. Uh, here's a chance for you to have a dinner party with faculty and colleagues talking about a, a meaningful issue that you've been thinking about. So the, the, the faculty that will be engaging in these dinner table conversations this semester are David Nelson, Rabbi Nelson, uh, uh, Professor Michelle Dominey, um, Professor Marina Fensuelen, and then because someone asked me. Um, and I encourage you to uh, contact Tina uh, Stanton and sign up for one or two of these dinner conversations if you're interested. Uh, they're usually really a lot of fun. Students in the surveys we sent at the end of the year, the students who go say they're really one of the highlights of, of, of the course and of, and of the experience. All right, so that's what I have to say. Um, it, as I said, all these lectures are organized by our student fellows. Um, and tonight, uh, the student fellow who, who originally suggested and now has taken the leadership in organizing tonight's talk is uh, Sasha Mejo, uh, who's a first year student and biology major and Hannah Arendt uh, student fellow. So please welcome Sasha. <laughs> Roger. Um, so the person who is going to come speak tonight is one of my personal um, 
inspirations. Uh, Reverend Sylvia Sumter is from Brooklyn and currently Minister of Unity Washington, D.C. So the Unity Spiritual Movement Um, the Unity Spiritual Movement began in the late 1800s, and it's based on um, prayer and the power of mind over body. So it's kind of a um, very particular spiritual movement because um, the founders, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, so they were a couple from uh, Kansas City, Missouri, um, with three boys, and they had suffered lifelong physical ailments and constantly looked for healing. So they heard a lecture from a metaphysician named E.B. Weeks, and Myrtle came away with a startling new idea. She said, I'm a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness. In two years of prayer and meditation, she healed her body from tuberculosis. Um, Charles also began to investigate the spiritual principles and healed a leg that had been damaged in a childhood ice skating accident. So to share, the, to share the exciting spiritual teachings they had learned, the Fillmores didn't start a church but began to publish a magazine. So the magazine was first called Modern Thought and it came out in um, 1889. Um, today it's called the Unity Magazine and it's still being published. Um, Later on, Charles N. Myrtle Fillmore came to form a prayer group that is now called Silent Unity, which is a 24-7 like, prayer ministry that responds to about 2 million people through letters and telephone and email and different types of communication nowadays. So that's to explain kind of the backstory behind the Unity Spiritual Movement. Um, Reverend Sumter, who is here tonight, has always had the gift of teaching ever since she began, um, especially teaching us to manifest our true selves through meditation and expanding our spiritual consciousness. She was licensed as a minister in 1986 and ordained a unity minister in 1987. She's also spoken and administered spiritual teachings to others through her work prior to, during, and after ministerial school. Reverend Sumter's academic accomplishments through her work, um, sorry. Reverend Sumter's academic accomplishments include a Master's of Education, Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, and Associate of Arts in Business Administration. She has served as the she has served as the Assistant Director of the Higher Education Opportunity Program at Syracuse University. Um, after this, she became the Director of Higher Education Opportunity Program at Anandaga Community College in Syracuse, New York. Being a gifted teacher, she's traveled around the world and around the country also, being a speaker at other churches, institutions, and or schools, inspiring more and more people every day. One of the reasons that Reverend Sylvia is able to touch the hearts of so many people is in the way that she talks both to a group and to the individual. Most of the people hearing her speak feel like she addresses them on a personal level, like she's talking to you. Um, she's able to do this by using her real life experiences to teach the greatest things that she knows and to be able to expand to as many people as possible. So tonight I hope that you can all be inspired by this wonderful woman. Please welcome Reverend Sylvia Sumter. Wow, that was really, that was nice. <laughs> Lovely. Well, I just want to uh, begin by offering my deep, deep gratitude for the invitation to be with all of you tonight, because this is very special uh, for me. And I'm grateful to you, Sasha, for recommending me. Um, it's nice to get out from my regular routine and be amongst the people. <laughs> so this is really exciting for me. 
Um, and one of the reasons why I'm excited to be here, be outside of the work and the field that I get to play in now, you know, the, as a minister or as a spiritual uh, leader and a person who works in spiritual transformation, this is akin to my second uh, great love, and that was working in institutions of higher education. And so um, I thought I would never be able to give up my students and, and working with students, but ministry called. So this really feels like such a, um, a delight and a joy to be here because it reminds me of a work that I loved as well as ministry. And um, I didn't know much about Bard College, but it really feels like you guys have it going on. This is a really, yeah, it's, a, it's a, what we say about unity. It's, it's like the best kept secret in town, you know? It's a, so uh, I just feel honored. Uh, I love the mission. I love the, the purpose for, for your being, the work that you're doing, and especially this series on the courage to be. That is so important, this courage to be, because as you all are aware of, we are living in exciting times uh, at this point, right? I'm going to call them exciting times. Um, and actually, it's a time of great transformation, a time of transition of sorts. There's always a, a, a movement from one era to another. And usually when you're either at the beginning or the end, which is the same thing, the beginning or the end of a movement, it's usually a challenging time. There's some turbulent times. I, I image when, when the automobile came and people had to give up their horses. They were so used to their horses and this, this, this contraption here. Um, it was just a struggle. And those who were able, there were some who were able to uh, lay hold of that vision, that new thing, and then there were others who just couldn't get with it. it they were leery of it. And, and so this, you always have this, this interesting time when you move from one uh, era into another. And I believe that at this particular time, we're moving into um, the phase, uh, the next phase of our evolutionary growth. It feels like this is major and that we are really at a crossroads. We are at a crossroads in our expression and our experience as a species on the planet. Because we have the ability at this point as never before to actually uh, annihilate ourselves <laughs> and to destroy life as we, as we know it. And so we're at a, at a crossroads to see whether or not we will actually make the leap into a higher order of life, or will we descend into the dis extinction by the destruction of our natural resources, by the destruction of that which gives us life, that which sustains us, which of course is Mother Earth itself, and all the inhabitants upon it. And so we have to make a choice at this point. I was just reading in the news where Korea and uh, Russia are getting closer to perfecting their ability to send nuclear missiles, um, you know, heading out our way. I also read where, for the first time, that there's actually a country that might run out of water, which is South Africa. So these are very, we've never been at this juncture before where we, we have to make a choice. Which direction shall we head in? And I, I believe that as we see so many of our traditions and we're witnessing things that have, we've taken for granted that there are systems and institutions breaking down and, and changing. And I always say, when something's breaking down, don't panic, because it's also the opportunity for something to, to build up. It, it, it could mean that, that there's a breakthrough coming, not just a breakdown. But the institutions, as we know it, are changing. So much so, the family structure is changing. Our monetary system is changing. You know, I'm just getting hip to bitcoins and, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out, well, what's that all about? You know, and uh, so, so that's changing. Uh, our food sources are changing and the distribution of food, the distribution of, of, of wealth. 
Um, you know, our, we're in a digital age. Uh, I remember, you know, the, we, we had the, the age, of, we're in the information age, but you remember when the, we had books and now people have e-readers and, you know, everything is uh, in flux. <laughs> and we have an opportunity to witness this. This is such a special time because we are at the, the critical point uh, of making that all-important decision. And <clears throat> so I'm thinking with all of this, being said, there's some bad news and there's some good news. And the bad news is that there really is no single person that is going to come and save us. You know, years ago we had your great leaders, whether it was the, uh, John F. Kennedy or, or Woodrow Wilson, well, somebody would come and lead the day. Well, there. The bad news is there is no one leader coming. However, the good news is, and we've heard this before, is that we are the ones we've been waiting for. Or I should say you are the ones, because I'm sort of moving out on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> but you are the ones. You are the ones that we have been waiting for. And what is different about this time in history is that there's so much more emphasis on the collective. Years ago, it was the individual pursuit of life. And now this, the collective must act together. So we must come together to save ourselves. And I love it, what the young people are doing in Florida. You know, they're like, we're not gonna wait for anybody else to try to save us. We're gonna do what we need to do. So there's, a, there's this push of coming together and taking a leadership role, not as an individual, but collectively. All people must begin to do that. And what I see is that the future, not only is the future of our nation and our democracy in question, but dare I say the world over is in dire need of conscious and conscientious and compassionate souls, people who are willing to hold in their hearts and in their consciousness the highest good for all concerned, the absolute highest good for all concerned, not just for a select few, but for the collective, the totality of life itself. And what's needed is those souls who are willing to boldly go where no man has gone before. Okay, that's from Star Wars. I they don't know about that probably, but you're laughing because you understand. That's from Star Wars. But I love that. I love that, that thought and that thing. Who is bold enough to go where no one has gone before? Because we are at the point of having the ability to create a new world consciousness, a new world culture, something that is higher than we've ever expressed before. And I'm speaking about those who are willing to, to lead, but to lead from the spiritual plane. To lead from the spiritual plane. That is, those who will have the courage to be a spiritual warrior, a spiritual warrior. Because I believe that the next revolution really has to be a re-evolution. See, not just a revolution, but it's a re-evolution because that is what is at stake at this point in our growth. And it's a re-evolution, it's a spiritual one that has to be the next great movement. Because I believe that that's the only thing that is going to allow us to come together to, to, to talk and foster peace and harmony and a sense of oneness and a sense of, uh, of, of commitment. Because if we try to approach it from the confines of human nature, our humanity gets in the way. Our egos get in the way. We want to be the first country, the best country, the greatest country. We want to be the one who has it all, and that's not going to work any longer. But if we have the ability to come from a spiritual plane and a spiritual perspective, 
than the, the limitations of our human nature, like greed or, or selfishness or, or, or wanting to hoard everything for us, that goes away when the focus is from a spiritual plane. Because in the spiritual realm, there is enough. In the spiritual realm, there's a sense of oneness. In the spiritual realm, there's a connection. There isn't division, there's a sense of all belonging as spiritual beings on the planet, having a human experience, but we are spiritual beings. And so that's the next revolution, I think, that has to take place that will save us from ourselves. So the question is to you, I ask, do you have the courage to be a spiritual warrior? Now, I know the language of warrior may not appeal to many people. Um, but the kind of warrior that I'm speaking of, a spiritual warrior, is quite different. Because a spiritual warrior does not wage war, but it wages, a person wages peace. A, a, a spiritual warrior, you know, is not about conquering over things. It's not conquer to conquer over people, over things, but to conquer from within. The spiritual warrior that I'm talking about does not stand against anything, but stands with and for something. My, my buttons you all have, I will stand up for humanity. So this is a whole new concept that, that I hope that we're able to really take within. Because the spiritual warrior knows that life is lived from within out. Not from the without to the within, but from within out. And a spiritual warrior will see the futility of trying to change the external world, trying to change the outer world without first having changed the inner domain. First having changed the inner world. Because if you try to manipulate the effects without changing the inward, you're just going to repeat the same things that you've always done because there hasn't been a shift or change in consciousness, right? So any change in the outer has to first occur with a change in consciousness. Because everything begins in consciousness. Even the, the construction of this lectern here began first as an idea, before it was manifested as a thing. It's an idea held in someone's mind with all the great details of what it would look like. And so to, to try to start from the outer to make your changes without having changed your inward being, it's not going to work, nor will it last. And we've all done that, right? We hadn't had a change of heart, we hadn't had a change of mind, and yet we tried to do something here in the outer, only to repeat the same behavior. I like to say sometimes, you know, in, um, in ministry when people will come up and, you know, they want to come to church and they want to, they, they'll get saved on Sunday and then that Monday they go out and raise hell again. And it's like, what happened to that? Because there was no inner transformation. It was all an outer ritual or something they performed or something that had no inner meaning. Life is consciousness. Life is consciousness, meaning that how you think, how you feel, how you perceive, what you value, these are all inequalities, and these are the things that begin to outpicture in your life. So your life really is a reflection of your consciousness. Show me your life and I'll tell you pretty much where you live in the inward parts of your being. Not to make a sense of judgment, but you cannot help but reflect what is within you. And so life is consciousness. So with that in mind, if that's the truth, then what will we do? Is it safe to say that, that in order for us to change life, society, or whatever, that the journey of transformation that we are undergoing, the journey to transform situations and circumstances and conditions has to begin with the journey of self-transformation, right? Self-transformation first, or at least it begins with a deep knowledge of oneself. And a spiritual warrior 
seeks to gain wisdom into his own soul, into his own heart, into her own heart and being and soul. You start there first, a spiritual warrior looks at the relationship that, he, that, that is occurring with self and then relationship to the sacred other or to the divine or to life. But I must know from whence do I come to relate, to live my life, to interact my, with, with, with those who share this experience with me. And so there are three major, I think, elements that will help one to become a spiritual warrior, but that you must have these elements to fuel your journey, to fuel your progress. And the three things are purpose, principles, and power. Purpose, principles, and power. Now people have been asking, what's the purpose of life for the begin since the beginning of life, probably, right? Everybody, what's the purpose of life? And I say, you know, I'm not so much interested in what the universal purpose for life is, and I'm not sure we can come up with one. But I'm more interested, does the individual understand their own particular purpose for their lives? Do you have a purpose for your life? And are you in tune with your purpose? for your life? Do you have a, a spiritual vision for your life and how you will live your life and the awareness of the qualities of your own consciousness? Do you have that? So I want to talk a little bit about a spiritual vision because it's equated to your purpose. And a spiritual vision for your life is not about the goals that you might have. Having a spiritual vision for your life is not about the dreams that you may have. It's not even about the things that you want to acquire. Or it's not about the things that you want to accomplish in your life. Having a spiritual vision is really about the inner state of being. Your inner state of being. Because remember I said life is consciousness. Your life is going to outpicture what's happening inside your being, inside your thoughts, inside your feelings, your perceptions, which then your actions will be based upon. So a spiritual vision then is what is the state of your inner being? And it's that part that how it, it, it influences how you will engage life, how you will interact with life and with others, right? It, begin, it, it sets up the framework from which you're going to make your choices in life. It's the foundation for how you are going to show up. How are you showing up? How will you show up in life and with life? See, everybody else can see how you show up. Can you see how you show up is the question, right? Because we don't know what we look like. We, we need a mirror. Don't you need a mirror to see what you look like? But I can see what you look like, and you can see what I look like. You see how I'm showing up, and I can see how you're showing up. But do you see how you are showing up for yourself? What's your spiritual vision? It's like having a personal credo for how you intend to engage the world and life. I just returned from India on Monday. And I go there to take some classes on, on meditation and uh, yoga. And basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a course I'm taking to really reflect upon myself. They help you dig deep. There's no hiding out. We go in there and find out who's in there, what's in there, and how are you showing up. And so we had to come up with a spiritual vision for our lives. <clears throat> Not a long dissertation, but something really short. And so mine was to joyously connect through loving and allowing. To joyously connect through loving and allowing. Because for me, I want to connect with people. It's important. I recognize that, that everything, life is also relationship. We are always in relationship to something else. Right? Or someone else. So how are we connecting? 
And for me, I want to make sure that I'm connecting, and I want to do so with joy, because I need, I need joy. Let's face it, there are people that come into your lives that you have to connect with that don't give you joy. In fact, they take you to just the opposite, right? <laughs> You're like, oh my God, how can I handle this person? How can I take this person? Ah, right? But I want to be able to joyously connect through love and allowing, right? Because that's really important. And when I come across those situations and people that I feel, gosh, I, I just don't think I'm going to be able to connect here, I try to remember that I need to find something, that some place, some things, some commonality, something that's going to help me to connect, something that will help me to open my heart, open my consciousness, so that there can be transformation, so there can be understanding, there can be healing, because I basically do want to connect, because not to connect is not going to work. This is what we've had thus far. So we know it's not going to work. I know that, yes, it's easy for me to discard those whom I don't care for. It's easy for me to say, you know what, ah, ah, great, that's over there. But that's no longer an option because the world is close. See, before we didn't have to worry about those across the pond and across the water because we never saw them. Now they're in your living room. They're on the internet. This, 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 everything is close. So we must learn how to connect once again. And especially in the age that we're moving in, when there's such a, a push for disconnection. You know, we have AI. Soon our robots will be doing everything, cooking, cleaning. They'll probably be coming to school, taking your papers and writing your papers. And it's like, oh, well, it's coming. OK? So, so how do we connect? <laughs> This is his future. How do we connect? How do, because what makes us human is our ability to relate to one another and to make. So for me, connection is possible. And I want to do it joyously because I know that I can do it judgmentally. Right? And when I begin to judge, I'm going to what? Separate, alienate, categorize, put you over here, you're here, you're here, you're there, you're this. And all that does is create and foster separation when the only thing that's going to heal is a sense of oneness and the collective coming together. Diversity, but yet oneness within diversity. And so I use that when, when, I'm, when I'm up in a tight place or a situation. What do you want to do, So Yeah, my basic ultimate purpose is I want to connect and I want to do so through love and understanding. Because with love comes, and I'm not talking about sentimental love, but with divine love comes, comes understanding, it comes forgiveness, it, 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 you know, it comes, uh, 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 comes with a sense of openness and a willingness to connect. And so I want to do it with love, which is the ability in case I have to forgive you, because forgiveness is very important if you're going to do any kind of work, because there's always something to forgive, you know, but always. But, but if I can do that, and then I can remember, oh yeah, what's my ultimate purpose here? My ultimate purpose is to connect. So I can move closer, not further away. And then I move to the allowing. See, if I can love, then I allow. And let me say this about allowing, because a lot of people think I'm talking about resignation when I say you just allow. I'm not talking about, oh, well, yeah, they're going to come and bomb us out or whatever. We should just allow that. I'm not talking about that. Allowing has nothing to do with resignation. It has everything to do with, uh, uh, it's not accepting limited behaviors. It has everything to do with seeing what is. Seeing what's there, but instead of using my energy to uh, fight or resist what's there, I use it to come up with a higher choice, a higher uh, expression. It's like the concept in jujitsu. They say if someone's coming at you with a bunch of negative energy or they're rushing you and they're coming at you with a force, you got two choices. You can stand there and put up your dukes and, right? But then you're what? You're stuck right there. Or when they bring all of that energy, that negativity, you simply step aside and it passes. Then they might come back again and you step aside. See, because it takes what? It takes two to engage. So when I talk about allowing, I'm not talking about resignation, but I'm talking about I find higher ways <laughs> to deal with the energy that is coming at me that is not appropriate. If I stand there and I combat it and resist it, and I'm stuck. I'm engaged in a, using my energy in a way that I choose not to. So I let it pass, 
and then I take whatever action I want to take. I make a higher choice. So I don't stand there, I don't resist, I persist. I persist in what is my vision, what, is, what, what am I trying to accomplish? I don't want to be in battle with you. A spiritual warrior is not about battling. A spiritual warrior is finding the higher way, finding a way that's going to work for all. Because I'm not against anything, I'm not against war. I'm for peace. See, I'm not against injustice. I'm for justice. I'm not against anything. It's a waste of my energy to be against something, but a positive use of my energy to be for something. I am for the highest good of all concern. A spiritual warrior is always for the highest good of all concern. I'm not standing there doing battle. I understand who I am and what I am about and what I'm for and what I will stand up for. So I want, you to, I want to encourage you to, to take some time and to find out what is your spiritual vision. Doesn't have to be long, but get some qualities of what is it that you, that you can rely upon. Mine is joyously connecting through loving and allowing. And when I get stuck, I say, you know what, what's my open, ultimate purpose, Sylvia? It's just to connect here through love and allowing so I can back off when I need to and take another choice. And you'd be surprised, that simple phrase, it helps me so much when I'm stuck. So I encourage you to find out what's your purpose or your spiritual vision. Because once you have your purpose, then that can begin to guide your principles. See, you have an overarching purpose, but then it guides your principles. Because your, prim your, your purpose has to be backed by now your principles. Right? It's undergirded by your, your, your purpose. Your principles are undergirded by your purpose. But now you need, you need these principles. And here's the tricky thing about principles. is because we all like to say we have them. Right. Everybody said, well, I, you know, everybody said, yeah, I got some principles I live by. If I had to ask you, well, what are the principles you live by? Chances are you'd tell me, well, uh, I live by love. I'm a loving person. Oh, yeah, I'm kind. You know, I, I believe in honesty. Those, those, I'm a person of integrity. That's lovely. Those are noble qualities and principles to have. But here's the challenge with that, is that the challenge comes is that there is a disparity between what we say we believe and adhere to and what we actually do. Okay? Because it's easy to say, yeah, I believe this. Yeah, I believe in love. Sure, I believe in acceptance. I believe in tolerance. It's easy. But there's a disparity sometimes in saying and doing or being. And, and it's fine because it's part of the human condition. Nobody's perfect, and we're not always able to be 100% you know, uh, uh, in, in this high state. I love being a minister, but there are times when I'm just an you know, ordinary girl from Brooklyn who does some ordinary, sometimes maybe even some dumb stuff or whatever, because nobody is perfect. Everybody falls short. But here's the thing. As a spiritual warrior, what you want to do is we will have human frailties. You're going to have human flaws. We're going to make mistakes and all of that. But the key is to be aware of them. To be aware of that and to be able to see yourself while you're in the midst of these flaws or these frailties that you might have. To be in, in, uh, aware of how you're showing up when your actions don't really match your intentions. Because that happens, right? Nobody's perfect. And so, but to be aware, but to be able to see it when you're in the midst of it, how are you actually showing up is key. See when you're out of alignment with your principles. Because everybody will be from time to time. Nobody's 100% kind. Nobody's, not even Mother Teresa. You know, nobody. Everybody has moments where we forget. So the key is then is to be able to see as a spiritual word, to see yourself, see the underbelly of yourself, and not to be afraid to call yourself out. Because if you can't get the consistency, then if you're going, you're going to live in an illusion that you're just some wonderful, perfect being. Your principles will have no weight. 
So it's okay to see when you're out of alignment with that because the purpose is really to grow. See your unconscious biases. Everybody has them. You know, people tell me, oh, I'm not prejudiced. I say, yes, you are, everybody is. So don't fool yourself. Oh, I'm not colorblind. Yes, you are, everybody is. And don't get into the illusion of principles that you're not able to really live. Instead, own all of it so that the reality of what is taking place in your inner state of being has truth to it. And from that ability to really see, you can be free. From the ability to really see, that's what we like to say, to see is to be free. If you, you can't heal what you can't see. You can't transform what is unknown to you. So make it a part of who you are to understand, well, what are my principles? And then to notice when you are out of alignment so that you can then bring yourself back to a level of truth and begin to live your truth. Not as a form of punishment, but as a form of the weight of really being authentic, being clear, being true, and owning all of yourself. And once you can do that, you're ready to then for, to, to really uh, take the third P, which is power. Because now you can step into your power. When you have your purpose clearly delineated, you know your principles that you stand upon and for and with, and you see when you don't, and you're now ready to step into your power. Because here's the thing. <clears throat> power is, is a powerful thing. And it has, has nothing to do with power over anything. A warrior's power is not about power over, it's power within. It's always what's taking place here. Because if you have power over this, over your own self, you can do anything. Anything. So the power then, you've got your purpose, you have your principles, you understand that you are more than a conqueror in the outer, but that you con can conquer the within, your inner state of being. You're ready to take on the power. Now I want to get clear again, power is not this thing over anything, but it's the power to change. The power to change your mind. The power to change your perceptions. The, because we all know people who get stuck in their opinions, right? Stuck in their ways of seeing things. Stuck. Well, a warrior is flexible. And you can change your thought, change your perspective, change your feelings, change when something new is presented. You're not then stuck. And so you understand that this power you have is the power to change, and not to change something out here because we're starting where? Within first. When you change your within, the outer begins to change naturally on its own. When you change how you interact with another individual, that relationship will change on its own. I don't have to get you to like me or love you. If I'm coming from love from within myself, that love moves out and does what it needs to do. I don't have to manipulate it from the outside. We're a mass of energy and vibration. And when we can raise our vibration, raise our energy, raise our consciousness, then all of a sudden you'd be surprised because we are a collective and because we're energetic beings and because we are influencing each other. There's energy here that we are exchanging with each other, albeit unconsciously or automatically or whatever. But when we raise the vibration, our own individual vibration, it makes it easier for us to then engage others. And to take, because here's the thing, a high vibration will always lift up a lower vibration. It's like a tuning fork. You know how a tuning fork works when you're tuning a piano, and you know, right? You hit that, that strong vibration brings everything that is a lower vibration into alignment. So when you are coming from a high place within your own being, you actually have the ability to affect what's happening around you. We all have seen it, that one person can come into a room and change the tenor of the whole room. You've seen that, right? They can either bring in joy, somebody comes in here, right behind their joy, they're open, we're all shift, we're open. Somebody could come in here and they can bring a negative down energy and we're all on own because we are influencing each other. So you have power to raise your vibration, to open yourself up, to be a stable 
force of peace and harmony and love. See, the, the, what's needed now as a spiritual warrior, this is significant, because if you can bring the stability of your presence, the consciousness of who you are, the power of your presence, of your purpose, of your principles, if you bring that, that can actually change what is happening around you. Others can feel your vibration. They can feel your peace. When I go to India and I'm in the ashram, I feel the vibration of these monks who are meditating. And I'm not at their level, but the moment I step in, guess what happens? I'm like, wow. Now, the trick is to maintain it when I come back here. That's what I'm working on. But I know that I'm affected by that. It's power. It's real. And so we want to be able to figure out how can we be a stable force? How can we bring our wisdom, our creativity, all of these things that lie within us to bear into the world as a spiritual warrior? You have so many gifts to give. You have a purpose. You have your energy, your, your being. Because the spiritual warrior knows this, that your power is not your own. The power of a spiritual warrior is not your own. It comes from, you can call it the source, you can call it the supreme energy, you can call it God, you can call it the divine, whatever. There is an energy in which we are all created in the image of and after the likeness of. And all of the qualities of the creator are imbued within us as the creation because the creation is never separated from the creator and so we have the power that comes from a higher source lying right within us we have access to wisdom to creativity to abundance peace joy all of the fruit of the spirit we have that we were born with it we are created in it we have access to it to utilize it in our lives and our friends. We're just not maybe aware of that. But the spiritual warrior recognizes it's his or her inherent qualities of being that come from the source and begins to share that, to tap that, to express that in the world. And so we hold the keys to transformation in our hearts and in our minds. And it is up to us to bring it forth. And the last thing that I want to share that a spiritual warrior is skilled at quieting the mind. If life is consciousness, your thoughts, feelings, attitudes, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. But the spiritual warrior is adept at quieting the mind and entering into the realm of pure consciousness entering into that spiritual realm so that whatever is needed at any given point in time can come forth as divine guidance, as wisdom, as whatever intelligence is needed, as clear directions, as solutions, as insights. But that comes through the quiet mind. And so the warrior is skilled at that because from that level, from that inner state of being, that inner place of peace, the warrior then takes action. And the action that the warrior takes at that point is action that's going to be right action, true action, divinely ordained action that will be for what the highest good of all concerns. And so it's important that we understand that we come from this inner place where we can actually transform the world by being transformed from within. So I want to just leave you with this thought that you have everything you need right within you. You have everything you need not only to be successful in your life, but you have what it takes to be and make, to be a positive force for good, to, to make a positive and powerful impact. You have something to contribute or you would not be on the planet at this time. You are here by divine appointment. And so this is your time. And I just ask you, do you have the courage to be a spiritual warrior? Because you're the ones we've been waiting for. I'm waiting for you. 
So be bold in your purpose, be bold and fearless in your principles, and claim your spiritual power. Happy journey. Wow.